How many of you came here just for the GPU? No. <laughs> Few hands. That is that is good. Uh, well, hopefully, yeah. No. Well, hopefully you'll uh, also walk away learning something new. All right. So my name is Shashank. Uh, I'm a developer advocate at AWS. Uh, what that really means is uh, I work with developers, try to educate them on some of the new capabilities. I uh, sort of specialize in infrastructure, but also on machine learning algorithms. But this talk is going to be about, I can remove this off stage, right? OK. So this talk is uh, going to be about how to select the right instance type for machine learning training and inference. So this is my agenda slide. So two key topics. One is choosing the right GPU instance. There are many different options, as you know for training and experimentation, and choosing the right GPU option for inference deployment. Uh, quick show of hands, how many of you are um, do spend, a most, spend most of your time training? And deployment? Wow, that's like almost a 50-50 split. That's good, because the presentation has 50-50 of each topic. OK. so. Chances are that when you were about to get started, you, you started on your laptop or on your desktop uh, training, and then your colleague or your boss says, hey, go try this on a fast instance on, on EC2 uh, or on AWS, and you go and you see all these different options. And you don't know which to choose, right? And uh, yeah, so it can be a little overwhelming because there are so many different options. So at the end of this presentation, what I want to give you is sort of a recommendation list on if you want X, you should choose Y, but let's not get ahead of ourselves. Uh, let's take a step back and talk about the different options that are available, some, uh, uh, some logic to the different instance types and when to choose which so that you can um, choose the right one for your workloads. All right, so let's start with training and experimentation. Now, over the years, uh, NVIDIA has, of course, been introducing newer and newer GPUs, and these GPUs have newer and newer architectures. So if you go back to uh, 2012, that was one of the first GPU instances on AWS. It was based on the Kepler architecture, the KADs, which you also know as P2 instances, if you have been using GPUs uh, from a while. Now, it's been several years since then. Those GPU architectures were pre-machine learning, pre-deep learning era. Uh, so a lot of the capabilities that are in today's GPUs hardware weren't there. So the newer instances, starting from Volta, Turing, and Ampere, which are uh, available as P3, P4, G5, G4, and G5G. You may not have heard some of these because they just launched one launch two days ago and one launch three weeks ago. So we'll go over when to choose this. So in order to try to understand uh, how these are categorized. So broadly, there are P family instances and G family of instances today, uh, as far as GPUs are concerned. Traditionally, or historically, P families were compute for compute, which is HPC workloads and uh, machine learning training workloads. And G was geared towards graphics. But the newer GPUs are uh, so performant and powerful and geared towards machine learning that the G instances are actually really great options for hosting your models or inference deployment. And P instances are still great for training, but also HPC workloads. Uh, when I say HPC workloads, anyone here do HPC workloads? OK. Yeah, it's a very niche community. Uh, think of genomics and um, other applications where the precision matters. So these GPUs actually support for double precision, FP64. But that's not relevant for machine learning. So back to our timeline slide. So over the years, uh, we've introduced all these. So I don't uh, recommend the older generation GPUs, regardless of cost. I don't know what they cost, but I don't recommend the Kepler's and the uh, Maxwell, the P2 and G3s for machine learning training. Don't choose them because there are cost-effective options on the left half of the screen, which we will discuss today. So starting with the latest generation of GPUs, which are the P4, instance type and the G5 instance type. G5 launched like really recently, a couple of weeks ago, I think. OK. Now, if you want the fastest GPU instance on AWS, then this is your instance. And you have 
large data sets, you have the compute needs that can take advantage of these GPUs. Then you want to choose P4 instance. It only comes in one size, which has eight GPUs. So you can't get a single GPU, uh, A100 GPU on AWS today. You get eight of these. And there are customers who actually work with terabytes and petabytes of data, have really complex models, very large models that need the 40 gigabyte GPU memory that's on these instances. So if you are one of those customers, then you, you don't look any further. This is your GPU instance type. Uh, all the record-breaking benchmarks are typically run on this GPU instance. And uh, yeah, so because this is newer, you'll see it supports a range of precision types that aren't, that don't exist in the older generation GPUs, which is why they're more performant because they take advantage of this lower precision arithmetic, which um, are frankly suffice for machine learning training and inference computation. And the FP64 is the double precision, which are typically used in HPC use cases, but not really relevant for uh, machine learning. And the other benefit is that all the eight GPUs have um, inter-GPU uh, connections, which, are, which is called NVLink, uh, high bandwidth interconnect that is really useful for uh, data parallel distributed training within the eight GPUs, but also model parallel. Uh, if your model is larger than 40 GB, you can do model parallel, split them across GPUs, and that uh, high bandwidth interconnect helps to make sure that your data flows in that pipeline. Your data comes in first GPU, second GPU, and so on. Okay, so fastest GPU. Uh, remember this because it'll be important. Then uh, in the same Ampere uh, architecture, there is G5 instances. Um, these, are, these were launched recently. These come in different sizes. As you'll see, there are single GPU instances and also multi-GPU instances. These don't come with NVLink, which means they are not uh, the best option for multi-GPU training. They're great options for training, prototyping. Uh, they're, they're pretty powerful for training, uh, not as powerful as the P4. And they're actually fantastic options for high-performance inference deployment. So if you're hosting your models, uh, the G5 instances. Now, if you're wondering why are there uh, one, two, three, four, five, five different single GPU instances, because the GPUs are the same, but the number of vCPUs are different, and the memory configuration is different. That becomes important if you're, uh, let's say you're deploying your model and you have a lot of pre-processing steps. So you want more vCPUs to do data augmentation and other pre-processing steps. And of course, there are multi-GPU instances which you can use for hosting multiple models on the same instance when you're uh, serving um, model for inference. And these also have 24 GB of GPU memory, so if you have large models, then they can fit in this. And you see interconnect is PCI, which means there is no NVLink. Uh, so don't use them for multi-GPU training. They're not really meant for that. Now, okay, we covered the Ampere generation, which is the latest generation of GPUs, so that is P4 and G5, uh, both new, uh, relatively new. Next, we'll take a look at the next, pow uh, next most, uh, I guess, most powerful GPU after this, which is the NVIDIA V100, which is actually two generations older in terms of architecture. But uh, remember, it's not just the architecture, but also the actual GPU that's in the instance. This is actually a highly po very powerful GPU instance, uh, the V100 compared to the uh, G4 and uh, G5, which actually have a lower power GPU, because their use case is different. Their use case is not primarily training. So the V100 has been around for, uh, for a while, and it's sort of the bread and butter training instance, which I assume most of you are using or have used in the past, right? V100, I think by far the most popular option for machine learning, deep learning training. Now this. The benefit of this over P4 is that this comes in variable sizes now. You can choose a single GPU or multi-GPU options depending on you're running experimentations or single GPU training. It also has NVLink, which is, makes it great for multi-GPU data parallel training on the same instance. But it uh, has lower inter-GPU uh, interconnect bandwidth compared to the P4 instances because it's the previous generation, right? And it comes in two flavors. There's a 16 GB variant and a 32 GB variant, uh, depending on if your model size exceeds 16 GB, then you want to choose a 32 GB variant. 
Now, this table, uh, I'm going to break this down. These are all the P instances between P3 and P4. I am not addressing P2 here because I don't really recommend them for deep learning training. But if you want to do training locally on a single instance, either EC2 or on SageMaker, then, or EKS, if that's what you use, then the P2 X large is great. Single GPU, great for prototyping, testing, training. Now, as you, uh, uh, in, as you try different options, you want to start experimenting, then the P3.8x large will give you four GPUs, which means you can run four parallel experiments on four GPUs or do a, a, a multi-GPU training. And similarly, you can upgrade to eight GPUs if you want to do more experiments or parallelly or if you want to do multi-GPU training. And you'll notice that P3 also has another eight GPU instance, which is named P3D and 24X large. And this is P316X large. Um, I want you to memorize it today. And uh, the key difference between that and the previous one is that this one has a GPU with higher GPU memory, the 32 GB GPU, whereas this one is 16 GB. It also has um, higher network bandwidth and all that. And finally, the P24X large is the fastest GPU instance which we discussed. Now, you, you may be tempted to uh, look at the cost of the instance and decide that it's going to be the cheaper instance for you, for your training, but that is just the uh, half of the math that you want to do when you compute the cost of training. So if you take a look at the uh, cost to train comparing P3 DN and P4, the cost per instance is higher on a P4, but if you look at time to train, because P4 is a newer instance type with a newer GPU that has um, faster uh, uh, performance, higher performance, the total time to train is actually substantially smaller on a P4, so the cost for the duration of training ends up lower on the more expensive GPU instance, because it's the cost per hour times the duration of training, right? So you may be tempted to go look at the cheapest GPU option and say, hey, this is what I want to use, but if you're not factoring in how much uh, time you're going to take, same, same argument applies to CPUs. You may look at a CPU instance and say, hey, this is cheaper, I want to use this for training, but it may take 10 hours to train, something a GPU might do in one hour or less, so you overall end up spending more on the CPU instance. So it's all workload-based. If you have a smaller uh, model that doesn't take advantage of the GPU, yeah, GPU is going to be more expensive. CPU probably is a better option. But if you have a, a model that takes advantage of these GPUs, then you will actually end up uh, lowering your cost to train on a GPU instance. Okay, so we spoke about the training instances, and we I will switch gears into software. Okay. It's important not just that you choose the right instance, but also the right software. Now, AWS has deep learning AMIs that you're probably familiar with, uh, and also offers uh, deep learning containers. And these containers include the latest um, frameworks from TensorFlow, PyTorch, MXNet for training and inference. Um, they're, all, they're all part of the um, deep learning contain, container registry there. But NVIDIA also offers uh, similar software. Uh, which is they offer containers for you know, popular frameworks. They have a much quicker cadence at which they release these uh, frameworks, and you can also use those. Uh, it's, it's completely your choice. The, uh, the key difference here is that the AWS deep learning framework containers will have uh, more capabilities that are geared towards managed training with SageMaker. So some of the features such as uh, some of the features such as uh, SageMaker debugger and you know, manage spot training with SageMaker and some of the other capabilities like data I.O. from S3 and back. So those are uh, enhancements that are part of the AWS deep learning containers. Um, and uh, uh, you, you can use NGC containers if you're actually using this with, say, EKS. Or you can also use it with SageMaker. It's completely uh, up to you. You have choice. And, and uh, yeah, so these are the options you have. You can choose to use the NVIDIA ones are the ones from uh, AWS. And NVIDIA uh, has a registry of not just containers, but they offer, um, they offer models and some industry-specific uh, use cases, libraries and use cases, and they are available from the marketplace. And 
I, I believe most, if not all, are free. Uh, you just need to go get them from the marketplace. And uh, let me quickly show you what that looks like here. Uh, figure out, switch. Did I do that right? I did that right. OK, so the AWS deep learning containers are listed on, on GitHub at uh, deep learning containers. Uh, you'll find a list of containers and the URL that you want to use. And the NGC container is in the marketplace. So they have all the same uh, framework containers, and you can choose to use this if you want to uh, with your training. And OK, let's switch back. All right, so you have these two options. And uh, now we spoke about instance types. We spoke about software that's available. Software is very important, actually. I, I should emphasize that you can choose the biggest, baddest instance on AWS, but if you don't choose the right software, you're just leaving performance on the table. If you just go pip install TensorFlow or PyTorch from upstream and just expect to get the best performance, you're pr probably not going to get that. You're going to leave performance on the table, it's going to end up costing you more. So it's important to actually use these optimized software that's been verified and tested on these instances, uh, which is why I recommend just using the AWS containers or the NVIDIA containers versus you know, getting something from upstream. And extending these containers if you have custom libraries on top of these. So you can run them, run them obviously, on EC2 instances, uh, or at the far end, you can run them on managed services like SageMaker and in between where you have um, custom setups with the EKS and uh, ECS. How many of you just use EC2? Okay, couple. And other far extreme SageMaker? Okay, again, I guess 50 50 split. EKS? ECS? Two, three hands. Okay. Yeah, that has a, a ops overhead, right? As in, you want someone to build and manage it. I don't enjoy setting up Kubernetes clusters. So, yeah. And, uh, uh, yeah, so you have all these options. So if you have an IT team or someone to help you actually set up these clusters, then you're likely using EKS or ECS and some layer that's built on top of it, like Kubeflow or something like that. Um, so these instances can be accessed from all these orchestration systems. Of course, with EC2, it's uh, do-it-yourself. Another, um, uh, so I'll show you a quick demo of how you can take advantage of uh, um, GPU instances with SageMaker. And uh, one of the benefits of SageMaker is, of course, that it is fully managed. Uh, and I'll show you what, what I mean by that. You don't actually have to manage the training instances. You don't have to actually manage uh, how it is provisioned. And let's take a look at a quick um, example here. Now, if you, if you are, uh, yeah, so if you're just getting started with uh, um, SageMaker, then this is how it works at a high level, right? So you, you as a user, um, will specify your training script, and behind the scenes, SageMaker will uh, download the training script into the specified framework container. You can specify framework version, you can specify framework uh, um, uh, version, and uh, let me show you, actually I have a I have an animation here that, that better illustrates this process. Um, yeah, you, you can bring your own training scripts or you can bring your own container. The bring your own container will, will work for, say, NGC containers, the ones NVIDIA provides. And bring your own uh, script is just, just provide a script and SageMaker will pull the right container for you. So essentially, this is how it works. You write up your SageMaker estimator function where you specify what your training script is, what kind of instance you want to run it on, a P3 instance, for example. And behind the scenes, SageMaker will take your training script, pull the relevant uh, container from ECR, and then it will provision a cluster of number of GPUs as specified. If you say one GPU, it'll provision one GPU. If you say eight, 16, 24, 256, it'll provision a cluster for you automatically. You don't have to manage that cluster. Uh, and it'll also copy your data set from Amazon S3, pull it into those instances, finish training, copy your models back into S3. All of this is uh, fully managed for you. Now, the bring your own container approach uh, is very similar. Let's say you want to use NVIDIA's uh, you know, latest, their numbering system, I think, is like year, month, 2109, or 2112, or something like that. So you can choose their latest container, pull it from the NGC registry, 
um, into wherever you're writing your code. It doesn't have to be on a SageMaker notebook instance. It could be on your laptop, as long as you can uh, pull their container and then use the SageMaker SDK to build a custom container. Now, this workflow is obviously a little more uh, involved because you're extending their container to include your code, and then push it to an ECR registry and tell SageMaker to pull that container from the registry, again, provision a cluster, and then uh, you know, copy data set from S3 and also save the data set back into... Uh... Okay, so this is a demo I wanted to show you. So this is a high-level workflow, but if you're new to SageMaker, then this is, the, this is the, all of the code that you need. Uh, you will first specify what kind of hyperparameters you want, and these hyperparameters will be passed into your training script by SageMaker as long as you can process these hyperparameters uh, the next step, of course, is to specify where your training script is, what kind of GPU instance you want, and how many you want. I mean, this is like magical for me. I can, I can just say 1 to 8 to 16 to 128, and it'll just provision this cluster for me automatically. And uh, at the same time, I can specify you know, framework version and so on and so forth, and just call the fit function, and it'll go finish training. And after it finishes training, it'll tell you uh, how long it trained, and how long you'll be built for. Now, com contrast this with you running something on EC2 instance where you're paying for the instance from the get-go. You provision the instance, and you pay it till you shut it down. But here, it's only charging you for the duration of training, and this is the same workflow regardless of if you are uh, using, uh, you know, bring your own training script or bring your own container. So that is one of the benefits of using a managed service like SageMaker versus EC2, you're on your own. So as long as you're... Uh, managing your instances yourself, then uh, you can choose either. So there are both great options, depending on what your needs are. Okay, so that was a quick um, overview. Another question that we commonly get is, um, okay, so I've chosen the right GPU instance type. I have chosen my right, uh, the right orchestration system or the right service to train. Uh, I've chosen the right software. You know, I'm using NVIDIA's. Uh, NGC containers, but I can't keep my GPU utilization high because I have an I.O. bottleneck. So how do you get your data from uh, wherever your data is into the training cluster so that you can actually train fast? So there are a few different options. The most commonly used option with SageMaker is Amazon S3. This is great if you for moderate size to large size data set, but also if you have a um, if you have a a job that actually uh, is compute bound, not I/O bound. What I mean by that is, if your training is taking longer than the time it takes to copy data set, then this is a great option. Uh, but there are applications where you you actually end up becoming I/O bound, which means your GPU is hungry. It's finished its forward and backward pass and just sitting there waiting, which means you are unnecessarily paying for a GPU instance. In which case, you want to explore other options to get your data set. And uh, in this case, SageMaker also supports EFS, which is uh, you know, a file system. The benefit, other benefits of this is that you can mount this to all the training uh, instances, but also the other benefit is this may be the place where you're storing your data set. And maybe other AWS services access, data set, data, access your data set uh, on the EFS drive. Uh, so it becomes your, sort of your central repository for storing data set that multiple users can access, but also your training service that you use. And if you really want the highest performance, then FSx for Luster uh, is very popular in HPC use cases, as I mentioned. So HPC use cases have you know, large data sets, and they want really high performance read and writes. And you can also mount an FSx for Luster uh, cluster with uh, SageMaker training. Uh, you can also use it with EKS or EC2. It's up to you. But with uh, SageMaker, you get a little bit of, of a managed um, setup here. And the other benefit of FSx for Luster is that it can, uh, uh, it can have a snapshot of copy into S3. So it can front an S3 bucket, if you will. So you get this file system kind of use case when you're using it for training. but there's uh, copy in S3. So that's the benefit. But unless you're really pushing the boundaries of uh, uh, deep learning training, uh, maybe you don't need FSx for Luster. S3 works for a lot of people because deep learning tends to be compute bound. 
which means there's enough time to copy data set, and SageMaker offers uh, both file mode and pipe mode. File mode is when it actually copies the data set. In pipe mode, it can stream the data set uh, directly into those compute instances. So that's uh, data sets. That's for training. So now we'll switch gears. Uh, so quick, quick recap, right? So there's P4 instances, P3 instances, great for training, optimized software with AWS deep learning containers, NVIDIA NGC, different ways to train uh, all the way from EC2, EKS, ECS to SageMaker, and uh, yeah, different ways to access your data set. So that kind of, I think, sums up all the different criteria that you're probably thinking of. Now let's switch care to inference deployment, which is, of course, when you train your model and you want to host a model as an endpoint, or maybe you want to run batch inference on large data sets. The criteria and the goals are very different for inference. So let's say your model is hosted uh, on an instance. The typical criteria that customers care about is like, what is the round trip latency from your mobile app or your web app to the model running the inference and back. Now for latency, latency critical applications, uh, for example, a conversational assistant like Alexa, you want this uh, response, the entire round trip latency to be under 10 seconds, 10 milliseconds or something like that. You may define something that is real time for your application. Now if you can't get a response within that time, then, then uh, uh, you know, the application is not going to work for you. And throughput is another uh, criteria, which means if you have sufficient number of requests coming in, can your instance process all those requests within that specified latency goal? So how much throughput under a specified latency? So they're both um, related criteria. Now, if you're doing batch, then you don't really care about latency. You just want to shove all your data into GPU and get the inference results, maybe run it as a cron job at night or something like that. But uh, if you, for most other real world use cases, if you're browsing through something and you want recommendations, then you want to process n number of requests under some latency which translates to good customer experience. And you want to be able to do all of this uh, in a at a cost <laughs> that satisfies your budget. So in some, in most cases there are trade-offs. Okay, uh, my cost budget is a little different, so can I trade off some amount of uh, throughput under that latency? So that is, a, this, that is the framework on, in, under which you're probably considering your inference deployment. Now back to our timeline chart, uh, we discussed the training instances, which are the more powerful GPU instances. Now we'll switch gears to the inference instances, which are G4, G5G, and G5. Uh, the G family of instances I mentioned uh, historically were graphics oriented, but they're actually fantastic inference deployment instances today, as far as GPU instances are concerned. And uh, G5G literally launched two days ago um, at the keynote on Monday, and G5 launched a little while before that, maybe a couple of weeks before that. We'll talk about what these instances are, starting with uh, G5. So G5 is sort of a successor to the G4 instance type, G4 instance had the Turing T4 GPU, and G5 has the new Ampere-based A10G GPU instance, which means uh, as long as it's part of that architecture family, uh, usually the features will be similar, which means the precision support, not, not always, but the precision support uh, will be similar, but there'll be differences in sort of the GPU memory. This has a 24 GB GPU memory, whereas A100 has 40, um, but this is okay for inference deployment because you can actually use reduced precision all the way up to integer eight uh, when you're deploying to a GPU. Uh, we'll talk about that a little more. And of course, the interconnect is PCIe because you're not doing training. It's each model runs independently on a GPU. And this comes in different sizes. Again, multiple single GPU sizes and also multi-GPU uh, options if you're hosting multiple models on the instance. If you uh, are doing graphics-related workloads, I don't, uh, then it turns out that G5 is um, several times faster, three times faster in rendering and graphics applications compared to the previous generation uh, G4, which is based on T4. G5 is based on A10G. So uh, anyone, do, anyone here does graphics applications, rendering and stuff like that? I see one, one couple of hands, actually. 
So uh, yeah, so if, if uh, I don't have any experience doing uh, these kinds of applications, but I, I imagine there's, it plays an important role in streaming and gaming and those sorts of applications, but also if, you're, uh, if you have sort of a virtual workstation in the cloud, then uh, this becomes very important. And uh, um, yeah, so this will give you better performance. Usually better performance also translates to lower cost when you consider sort of the time to perform your, uh, perform your math. Okay. Uh, G5 comes in different sizes, and uh, as, I, as, as I mentioned earlier, you, you want to choose the right instance type, instance size, based on if you're doing a lot of pre-processing on your instance. For example, if you, if you have a simpler model that you just run inference on, G5X large will work for you. But let's say you, are, you have your, so your instance will not just run the inference. It will also have your business logic. Maybe there's some pre-processing and maybe there's some post-processing steps, right? Those require CPUs. Those require CPU threads. They need uh, compute power. So then you would go further right in this graph and pick something that has a more capable CPU so that you can use that compute power to do the pre-processing and then run your inference on the GPU and then do any sort of post-processing, uh, which is why there are different sizes, because the question I often get is like, it's the same GPU, why do you have these different single GPU instances? It's because of that. If you're doing data augmentation, if you're, doing, um, if you're running your business application, which requires uh, compute there. And of course, the multi-GPU options are also there for hosting multiple models. And this, this is doing a comeback here. We discussed G4, but it's also a fantastic option for inference. Uh, you, you can use it for training if you are just prototyping and testing, but uh, it's, it's one of the lower cost option that also still delivers high performance inference requests with uh, G4. So many uh, letters, right? G, G, P, T, A. Um, which is why I'll give you sort of a summary table at the end of this talk. And again, uh, I won't go through this, but basically the same logic here. The key idea is always to uh, start small and then scale up. So don't try to choose the most powerful instance. Start with the smallest capable instance and then slowly. If that doesn't meet your throughput under latency goal within your budget, then you can fine tune that choosing the right option. Now the G5G just launched. Uh, two days ago. I haven't had a chance to play with it, but uh, it, it, it comes in all these different configuration. It's based on uh, Graviton, uh, which is ARM-based, and NVIDIA um, in their marketplace has, has new containers with uh, ARM-based libraries for, for doing machine deep learning inference. So if you try it out, um, uh, let me know. <laughs> this is, this, I'm going to be trying this out as soon as I get a chance. Uh, uh, after this conference. So I'm excited about this because this is the first time we have a GPU paired with uh, a Graviton processor. So this is very interesting. Okay, so uh, sort of high level guidelines here, something I already mentioned, always start small and then scale up. This is true for training or inference. Just start small, in most cases you will start with a CPU instance just to see what the training time on an epoch is and then introduce a GPU and then scale up. So you, you want to scale up, which is replace your existing small thing with a bigger thing and a bigger thing. And when you hit the wall, that's when you scale out, which is to do distributed training. Or in, in the case of inference, uh, uh, yeah, have multiple instances to process your request. So define your uh, target goal for your application, which is uh, what your latency and throughput, uh, whether you're doing real time or batch. If you're doing batch, um, you know, keep going to a bigger GPU until you can fit the biggest batch size because you're, the benefit of batch is GPUs are throughput devices. They are hungry for data. If you can keep a GPU fully utilized, then you're going to see sort of near linear scale up. Nothing is really linear, but if you, if you take a bigger instance and you can keep it fully utilized, then you're just going to see faster training. Uh, so that's the benefit of batch and GPUs. GPUs are like throughput devices. They're designed for doing batch sort of operations. And uh, uh, of course, if you're uh, using the like, popular deep learning frameworks, if you're doing custom code, then you can you have to write your own CUDA kernels, which is, which is not a very common uh, uh, use case because most models are supported on GPUs. 
So yeah, here are all the options and the sizes matter if, depending on how big your model is. So all the different sizes, uh, GPU size like 16 GB, 24. Uh, if you have a bigger model, then you want to choose 24. There are, there are uh, customers who will use the 32 GB V100 for inference deployment as well because they have a model that's large enough and they have throughput requirements that actually consume eight GPUs. So it, it's, it's uh, ultimately your goal. Uh, all right, so we spoke about software for training. So software for inference is also similar. You have access to the same deep learning containers which I showed you. They include TensorFlow serving, uh, MM, uh, MMS server for MXNet, PyTorch serv serving, and uh, a TorchServe, which is a PyTorch serving library. And um, yeah, there are containers for all of these things depending on which framework you're using. You can select the right container and deploy with SageMaker or deploy with EKS or deploy with EC2, whichever you choose to do. And with SageMaker, of course, you have like a single line uh, of code to deploy. Just put your model in S3, tell it where it is, tell what framework it is, and you can deploy it with a single line of code. It'll host an endpoint for you. Uh, you can also set up scaling policies if you have multiple requests coming in. And NVIDIA also has a model serving framework which recently, um, which recently ha added SageMaker support. What I mean by that is you don't actually have to go to AWS Marketplace to get this uh, model server. Uh, it's on ECR, so you'll use it just like a native AWS framework. Uh, you'll just uh, specify in Boto3 where uh, you can specify your endpoint configuration, specify that your container is NVIDIA Triton server, and it will automatically use that to deploy. I, I like this capability for a couple of reasons. I'll mention why. So you can choose one of the uh, framework-specific containers for deployment for your model server. Or with Triton server, you, it supports multiple backends. So you can use it for CPU or GPU. And they uh, provide a lot of features inside the container for uh, server-side batching. Um, you know, concurrent execution. There are a bunch of capabilities that they put into this single framework, which means uh, if you're switching frameworks from on the training side, maybe on multiple users switching frameworks, uh, you can still use the same container to Triton server container to actually deploy these different models. Uh, they have APIs that allow you to control, fine tune. There's also load balancing that you can do within the container if you're deploying it on a, on a uh, more powerful instance with multiple GPUs, right? So uh, this is a nice thing, and the added benefit is that um, it supports TensorRT, which is NVIDIA's compiler for inference. So does, does anyone use TensorRT here for deployment? You should, if you don't. Here's why. The model that you get out of training is not really optimized for inference. So when you, TensorRT is a compiler. So you provide it the model and you tell it to compile it. You can also specify reduce precision. It does a number of things under the hood where you get free speed up. It'll actually do, it'll take a look at your computational, computational graph and do graph optimizations and ultimately gets a compiled model which is far more efficient. Uh, in some experiments, you will see up to 10 times faster performance just by running a couple of lines of code to compile it. And once you compile the model with TensorRT, which is NVIDIA's compiler for GPUs, of course, you have to use it uh, on the instance that you're trying to deploy to, you can then use the TensorRT server, or Triton server already supports TensorRT compiled models. So it, it compiles it in, into a different in format, which you can then use with uh, uh, Triton server. You can go all the way up to integer eight precision and see performance increase uh, several fold from what you would see if you were just deploying with GPU from framework. You're really leaving performance on, table, on the table if you're not compiling your model after deployment while hosting. Um, yeah, so TensorRT. If you are not using it, you should check it out. Um, let's take a look at a quick uh, demo here. And this, this demo is really um, a notebook that NVIDIA contributed to the SageMaker samples repository. If you're using uh, SageMaker, check it out. Of course, you don't have to use this container in SageMaker. You can use it with you know, e EC2 or EKS or uh, wherever you're running your training. So the benefit of uh, 
this integration, as I said, is it's now in easier. You don't have to go to the marketplace and subscribe to actually uh, get it. So I won't, I won't uh, go through all the setup stuff here, but you'll see here that the, the container is actually in ECR. So it's, it's in ECR, just like your other framework containers. You should really try this if you're um, deploying your models. Uh, there, there is, uh, uh, yeah, so in this example, they actually go through the process of uh, extending the container and then, and then, uh, uh, uploading your data set to S3, and then, uh, so this is the endpoint configuration. If you, ever, if you ever use SageMaker, you know you have to create a model first and create an endpoint configuration and then deploy. Essentially, in your SageMaker console under, under inference, you will see models, so you, re, you register your model here, you create an endpoint configuration. The configuration basically tells you what type of instance to run on, uh, how many and so far, so, so forth, and the endpoint is actually the hosting of the models. So you, you specify uh, SageMaker, uh, you, you specify the uh, model URL and image URI, which is the SageMaker Triton container, and uh, rest everything is the same. So in this case, you're just deploying it on a G4 instance. So you get the same SageMaker experience uh, with the Triton uh, server that you can use and uh, host models and you know, query it and get uh, run inference and get requests. So feel free to try this out if you're already deploying with TensorFlow serving or, um, and especially if you're using TensorRT because <laughs> uh, you're really leaving performance on the table if you're not compiling your models before deployment. Okay, um, so that was a summary of uh, inference instances which are your G5, G4, um, G5, G uh, are the three instances that are really geared for inference deployment. But of course, if you're actually, um, if you actually need to deploy it on a P3 instance, you can, if that is what your workload uh, demands. So uh, here's a quick uh, summary of some of the resources that are uh, available to you. I said I'll provide you with a table and I'll, I'll, I'll switch back. Um, I have a blog post here called uh, Choosing the Right GPU for Deep Learning uh, on AWS. Hey, you're at the same talk. So I guess this is a copy of the talk. Uh, pretty much, yes. So I haven't updated it with uh, G5 and G5G because it just released. But uh, in this blog post, I go through in a little more detail on to the different uh, GPU instances, but also um, taking a look at <clears throat> sort of running each of these instances, taking a look at the uh, number of GPUs, NVLink, and so on and so forth. At the very end of this blog post, I have sort of a recommendation table here. It's a lengthy post. Uh, you, know, you can spend a weekend on it if you want to. But uh, I couldn't find a resource anywhere on AWS where it included the GPU, the GPU architecture, the GPU size, the network bandwidth, the GPU memory, the tensor core generation, whether it supports Nitro, what precision it supports, all in one place. So I created a table, and I've linked it in the blog post. If you ever want to uh, take a quick um, look into, hey, uh, you know, this instance, uh, what feature does it have? Does it support FP16, for example, right? Does it support tensor cores? Or can I, can I use this with uh, reduced precision intake because I'm compiling with TensorRT? So, yeah, here's a quick uh, table summary for you. And let's see, what other resources uh, do I have here? So yeah, so that's the uh, blog post that I will guide you to, and I'll be updating it soon with uh, three new instances that were launched, G4, G5G, two new instances that were launched, uh, with more information there. And uh, the blog post also has that, if you want the fastest instance, choose P4. If you want something to uh, prototype, then try this, right? So there's a list of recommendations there that I also encourage you to take a look at. And finally, uh, more blog posts, uh, links to some of the blog posts that include how to distribute training, how to use Spot to save costs, and stuff like that. So feel free to check those out. And uh, that brings me to the end of this talk. Uh, we have five more minutes. We need to do the raffle, but I'm happy to take questions at this point. And then we'll do a quick raffle. Yes? So if I need to train a model, and I don't care, I have a few instances that could run on, and I really want to optimize for cost to try to utilize spot instances. Whenever you're trying to deploy some of these spot instances, is there any better way to see availability of instances before just trying to spin it and waiting for a time on? Mm. 
question is, is there a way to know availability of spot instances before you try? Not that I'm aware of, but I've also not so far found availability issues with spot. For example, I'll, I'll, so in SageMaker, you can specify spot as an option and uh, just one line of code, and it'll do it for you. And typically, that instance will be available to me during the entire training job, so it doesn't get preempted. At least I haven't had that experience, probably once. And if it does, SageMaker supports managed spot training, which means as long as you're checkpointing, it'll sync those checkpoints to Amazon S3 as long as you specify where you want to sync, sync it to, otherwise it'll sync it to a default location, and then resume. Uh, but I don't know of a way that you would ahead of time know. It's supposed to be dynamic, right? It's all about demand and uh, uh, it's spare capacity, essentially. So that spare capacity is a dynamic variable. It keeps changing. So I, you have to just <laughs> try it. But in most cases, I've had success just getting access to the instance and uh, not getting preempted and saving costs on the entire training. Um, if you want to do the same thing with the EC2, you have to manage your own spot fleet and specify all that. But with SageMaker, it's like managed for you. Uh, even with uh, EKS, you'd, you'd have to manage it yourself. Any other questions? Yes. yes. Yeah, I would like to know which would be a good thing. What is your bottom line? Because, for example, we use the comments that you, you are showing there, like NTDSMI and top, uh -huh. and the of the stack, but sometimes you change from one instance to another, and you don't know that maybe you have a 4x, and then you change to a 12x, you see more. Uh -huh. Okay, we have more workers running at the same time, but you don't get the performance that you expected. So, what would be the best approach to identify where your bottleneck is? Bottleneck right. Is, and if you should be moving, for example, from the G4 to uh -huh. the G5 or, or what? Yeah. Is this for training or inference? So, we are doing training. For training, right? So there are so many factors that go into performance. This is such a common question, right? I, I went from P4, P3 to P4, and I don't see the 2x that's on the website or something like that, right? Like, I, I don't see the per There are so many places you could have bottlenecks. Like, it could be, when you have a faster GPU, then IO could be a bottleneck. You're not, like, feeding it fast enough, right? But there could be other inefficiencies, such as your framework is not taking advantage of the newer precisions in those uh, instance type. With, uh, with P4, for example, even G5, you, you have support for TF32. It's yet another precision type, right? And if you're not using the latest framework, then you're not taking advantage of it. And uh, so there are so many factors. So one thing I like to see is uh, SageMaker has this profiler capability. If you're, if you're using SageMaker for training, right? So you can switch on this profiling. It'll slow down your training, but it collects all, sort, all sorts of profiling information. You can actually take a look at... Uh, how much time for data loading was spent where GP utilization is zero, and then you have um, you know, uh, GP utilization spike up, but you look at the overall training time and you see that if you don't run it for sufficiently long number of epochs, it actually appears to be slower because you know, of some other bottleneck. So Profiler will show you that. You can actually visually, you can either plot it yourself or in the SageMaker UI, you can see the time it takes for initial loading. It'll also show you at kernel level, which kernel calls on the GPU actually take more time or less time. And don't switch it on all the time, but switch it on when you're profiling, and because it, it, you can specify the resolution of data to collect from the GPU. So if you keep it high resolution, switch it on, just slow down your training. But it's a good tool to analyze. Alternatively, you'd have to do it yourself. Like you, you mentioned NVIDIA SMI, you mentioned TOP, but you don't have to do all that if you use SageMaker debugger, if you're training on SageMaker. You, there's a, just a debug config option. You specify the debug config. You specify the resolution of data you want to collect. Um, you can go all the way down to specific tensor values, or you can just keep like the profiling information, which is CPU utilization, GPU utilization, and network utilization, and just analyze those. That, I, I recommend trying the profiler if you haven't already. Right. We have 33 seconds, it seems. Um, <laughs> Any other last questions and we will do uh, the raffle.